Hello everyone, welcome to Natural Grocers Nutrition Education presentation. We are so pleased and excited to introduce our guest presenter for this week, Mickey Trescott. Mickey is a nutrition therapy practitioner, chef, blogger, and best-selling author. Please welcome Mickey Trescott. Hi guys, thank you so much for, uh, for being here. I'm really excited to be giving a virtual presentation today. All right, so I'm going to share my presentation. All right, you guys, so today I'm gonna talk to you about four ways that you can eat like a Nutrivore. So if you've been in the store and you've been you know, trying to figure out what to eat, right? There are so many popular diets out there right now. There are things like paleo or autoimmune paleo or other elimination diets. There are low FODMAP, there's a keto diet, there's the carnivore diet, there's even vegan and vegetarian. And um, if you're like me, you might have been kind of confused and overwhelmed about all of the options, especially when we're trying to figure out what is the best way to eat or what is the right way to eat. Um, so sometimes I think we're making this way too complicated. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about nutrition concepts that actually don't fall under the umbrella of any specific diet or category, just to make it a little bit easier for you. So the first thing um, is what I call eating like a nutrivore. So it's kind of like a play on words, eating like an herbivore, which means eating only plants, or eating like a carnivore, which is eating only eat meat, um, or even an omnivore eating both. The word nutrivore just means um, somebody who eats a lot of high quality and nutrient dense food that's in season. And so you can already see that that applies to a lot of different ways of eating. Nutrifores aren't really defined by what they do or don't eat, so there's no long list of foods to avoid, but more the quest that they're on for seeking nutrient-rich foods in their diet. So like I've alluded to, the concept of eating like a nutrivore is one that is kind of can encompass any other diet or food philosophy, which is really fun and interesting when you start to think about what happens when you have a family where maybe different members of your family need to follow different specific diets for their health needs. Something that I think can thread through all of those ways of eating is actually this concept of eating like a nutrivore. So nutrivores ask a couple questions. So first they ask, is the diet providing the nutrients they need to be healthy and prevent future disease? Um, and then second, they're asking, does the diet support deeper healing or help you meet your wellness goals? So some of us, depending on our health history or phase of life, we might have different goals or lack of them with our diet, and that's totally fine. Um, personally, if you know anything about my story, I have two autoimmune diseases that I use a very specific diet in order to manage. But some, one of my family members, my husband, he doesn't have any chronic health conditions the way that I do. So what he can eat is a lot different than what I can eat. But the thing that I think we can really combine forces are on is um, nutrient density. All right, so there are four areas that we're going to talk about today. And these are all areas that are really important when we start to look at incorporating nutrient density and um, eating like a nutrivore. So first is nutrient density. You've heard me say that a few times, but basically it means how many different nutrients does a food provide, whether that is micronutrients, essential fatty acids, phytonutrients, fibers, and in what quantities. So we're actually looking at the chemical composition of the foods that we're eating. Second, we're going to talk about quality. So how was a food grown or raised? And what do we know about that due to how, what process that food has been through? Third, we're going to talk about seasonality. So was a food harvested at the peak of its growing season? Um, you know, basically, is it in season? And, and there's a lot of things that you might actually be really surprised to learn about seasonality. 
And then lastly, variety. Is a food unusual and does it bring anything unusual or um, beneficial nutritionally that we might not be getting from other foods that were kind of like in a rut of eating? So my favorite part about eating like a Nutrivore is that you don't have to choose food simply based on this binary, good or bad, healthy, unhealthy. You don't have like a list of foods like, well, I'm not a Nutrivore anymore because, you know, I ate a white food like a rice, <laughs> you know. Um, instead, you're putting thought into asking the deep questions about where that food came from, how it's going to support your unique healing journey. And by taking the time to consider all of this, you easily replace or crowd out other neutral, neutral or nutrient poor foods. So this is an issue that I have with a lot of people who are putting a lot of time into trying to control their diet and say, yes, this is what I'm eating. No, this is not what I'm eating. Sometimes when you focus more on just adding things in, the things that you don't want to be eating just kind of um, fall out of your naturally just because there's only can eat right um and i really like that additive approach um it it is really good for supporting a good healthy balance when it comes to thinking about um, the diets that we eat so first section is nutrient density so the nutrient density of a food refers to the micronutrient amounts of food contains relative to the energy it provides so you might have been taught to think of food as calories, which calories are the energy density of a food, but calories don't really tell us um, the full picture of what kind of micronutrients we're going to find in that food. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about micronutrients, but just know that they're comparatively small yet incredibly essential components that we uh, get in our food. Um, Nutrients like um, vitamins and minerals, so you're probably familiar with this. If you guys are shoppers at Natural Grocers, you know that they have really great source of all of these things that you can buy in their stores. This is what a lot of people think about when we think about nutrients. So these are known as micronutrients. And even though they're the components of food that we've studied the most, so we've quantified amounts that we need in our diet um, and supplements, we can take different things for therapeutic use. Um, what we know people need to be optimal healthy, they're not actually the only nutrients that we need. So when we're talking about nutrients, we're also talking about things that aren't as easily quantifiable. So these are going to be things like fiber. They're going to be things like phytonutrients. They're going to be things like pre and probiotics. So because nutrient density is more about comparison than it is just black and white or good and bad, I wanted to give you guys a little visual comparison of the nutrient density of two meals that you could pretty easily eat as a quick lunch on like a, a whole foods healthy diet. So these are going to be a chicken salad and a sardine salad. So while one of these options is really common, so chicken salad, the other one is practically on another planet when it comes to the nutrient density, especially when the nutrient density is considered um, in picking out the green vegetables that you use for your salad. So first, I want to start out by giving the nutrients and the protein part of our salad a little comparison on the chicken and the sardines. So here we have a chart comparing the micronutrient content of four ounces of chicken breast and four ounces of sardines. The gray is going to be that daily recommended intake for a woman of my size. So this used to be called the RDA, but the guidelines have been reworked and updated in recent years. So just know that that full bar represents the minimum optimal intake for an entire day. This is just one meal out of the day, out of a typical three meals a day. You can see the comparison in micronutrients from the chicken breast, which is represented in orange, and the sardines, which are represented in green. The chicken on the salad is going to provide about 10 to 15 percent of my daily recommended intake of many nutrients. The only one it actually outperforms sardines is vitamin B3. You can see that through the middle of the chart where the orange bar is about halfway through. In contrast, you'll see the sardines are going to give me, in many cases, 20 to 30 percent of my DRI of nutrients. And in many hard to find nutrients, I'd be exceeding that DRI. 
So those are the ones where you can see they go all the way across. And then at the end, I've labeled um, selenium at 109%, B12 at 420%, omega-3 fatty acids at 163%. Not only are these nutrients difficult to obtain for most people in the diet, but sardines are one of the best food sources of even something like vitamin D, which a lot of us don't even know that you can get from food. So this isn't about chicken being bad and sardines being good. Personally, I eat both of them all the time, but you can see how a simple protein swap can really be a game changer to the total nutrient density of your diet when applied this way. All right, so we're not just talking about proteins. <laughs> um, let's talk about the greens that you can put those proteins on top of. So we know that eating lots of green stuff is really awesome, but it turns out all greens are equal in the spectrum of nutrient density. So here we're gonna compare iceberg lettuce, which is the most common salad green you're gonna find, and then kale. Again, one of them is much more palatable, much more common. A lot of people love their, their you know, gentle baby um, salad greens. Um, but then there's a world of difference when nutrient density is concerned. So let's take a little look at the data. So here we're comparing the micronutrient content of four ounces of iceberg lettuce, four ounces of kale. Again, that gray bar represents the daily recommended intake for somebody my size and representing that this, or remembering that this represents one meal out of our day, you can clearly see the difference between having your salad with lettuce, which is represented in orange, or the kale, which is represented in green. The spread is even greater for these greens than they were for our proteins. So that four ounces of iceberg lettuce, it doesn't even give you 10% of the DRI of any micronutrients, but the kale will give you 10 to 20% of most of them, as well as a whopping 186% of copper, 3.7 thousand percent of beta carotene, that is not a typo, um, it's a vitamin A precursor, 181% of vitamin C, which did you know that greens even have vitamin C, you guys? Mind blown. And then 888% of vitamin K1. So let's put our protein and greens together to see what we get out of that whole meal. Okay, so this is what the chart looks like. So the orange is gonna be the chicken on the iceberg and the green is gonna be the sardines on the kale. Wow, right? Look at all those green bars that you get to 100% with that combination. And we didn't, I didn't even put a dressing in here, you guys. I just literally put greens and protein. Um, you've got 100% of copper, selenium, B12, um, vitamin A precursors, vitamin C, vitamin K, and omega-3 fatty acids. And then you also put a huge dent in otherwise hard to get nutrients, things like calcium, at 60%, folate 40%, vitamin D 35%. And remember, this is just for one meal during a day. Think of what you could do, nutritionally speaking, if you applied this to most of your meals. So to eat with a nutrient density focus means that you have an eye for those foods that are providing you the most bang for your buck. So you've, you guys have seen how rethinking just one meal a day might be able to, to help you easily meet your nutrient intake, um, which is something that 40% of Americans just eating a standard American diet don't even achieve. Rethinking two meals a day might prove even more transformative. And personally, this is the dietary element more than the foods that I eliminated out of my diet, but the, it was the ones that I added, the things like kale, the sardines, the broth, the organ meat, these were the things that helped me reverse the effects of autoimmune disease. All right, so your first action item is gonna be to research your most nutrient dense foods. So online nutrition trackers, um, one of my favorites is chronometer.com. It's a great resource for tracking dietary intake of micronutrients like vitamins and minerals. What I recommend doing is just tracking for a few days and trying to notice if there are any nutrients you're chronically low on. So you might be somebody that eats a lot of greens, so you might not be low in those nutrients, but maybe you don't eat any fish or seafood and you're, um, you're deficient in some of the omega-3 fats. Um, some common deficiencies are nutrients like iron, zinc, selenium, retinol, which is preformed vitamin A. Um, then your next project is going to be to research some of those whole food sources of those specific nutrients that you might be lacking and try to get them in your diet. So here's a breakdown of a pretty typical day for me. 
For breakfast, I have a bowl of chicken soup I reheat from the freezer, maybe half an avocado, piece of fruit. For lunch, I'll have a really veggie heavy salad. This is one of the recipes from my cookbook that I inputted here, my fall salad with green goddess dressing. It's a kale salad. And then for dinner, especially this time of year, I have a super stew like this chili, which is another um, recipe I inputted. It doesn't have any beans, but instead it has lots of root vegetables. So carrots, parsnips, beets. I use bone broth and some um, grass fed ground beef. And so you can see with all the green um, that this is a pretty good breakdown of which micronutrients that I'm getting in an average day. Um, day to day, you might not get 100% on all your nutrients, but if you log maybe three days or even a week, you will start to see the trends and be able to pinpoint any deficiencies in your intake. All right, on to the second topic. So the, the quality of a food has a major impact on the nutrient density contained. So now that you guys know that nutrient density is something that you're looking for, how are you actually going to identify which foods um, have the highest nutrient density? Most of the studies we have today are on conventionally grown or raised foods. And we're starting to learn more about the effects of food quality on nutrition, both in plant and animal foods. So first let's talk about produce. There's this question of conventional versus organically grown produce. So produce that is grown organically is done that is done so without chemical pesticides, which of course they're great to avoid because we don't want to be eating pesticides. But what a lot of people might not know is that organically grown produce actually has higher levels of vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants. In studies that I looked over for my book, some crops were even found to have over 50% more antioxidant content. And the reason this is, is because plants that are grown without the use of chemical pesticides and herbicides naturally increase their production of compounds that help them resist disease, pests, and other environmental factors, which then boosts their antioxidant content. So the antioxidants are the things that the plants are using to defend themselves. So not only does buying organic mean less exposure to chemicals and genetically modified foods, but it also means that we'll be able to receive the benefit of that higher nutrient content, especially when we talk about phytonutrients. Now, there's an issue of soil health, how growing conditions affect nutrient content. Uh, it is no, um, it is no it, wonder that you know we don't have a lot of nutrient density in our food because of how our soils have been stripped of so many nutrients because of big agriculture. Um, a 2004 study showed a steady nutrient decline in 43 vegetables from the years 1950 to 1999. Um, they found significantly less protein, calcium, phosphorus, riboflavin, iron, and vitamin C when modern vegetables were tested and compared to values taken only 50 years before. So part of this is probably because um, agriculture has focused on selective breeding, so they try to create crops that are really large and make a lot of yield and are resistant to pests, not really things that um, vegetables that provide us a lot of nutrition. But we also know that depleted soils and overproduction leave fewer nutrients for things to uptake. So purchasing fruits or vegetables from growers who take soil fertility seriously are likely to benefit us the most nutritionally. All right, then we're gonna talk about animal products. So quality doesn't just apply to produce. There's an even wider spectrum of possible nutrient content in meat, poultry, and seafood. So grass-fed beef has a more favorable ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acids. So that might ring a bell because omega-3 fatty acids are the ones that are anti-inflammatory. It also has a higher content of conjugated linolenic acid and precursors to vitamin and vitamin vitamins A and vitamin E, as well as containing higher levels of antioxidants. It was definitely news to me to find out that meat actually contained antioxidants, but you read, you heard that right, <laughs> they do. Um, raising cows on their traditional diet, which is pasture grass, translates not only to better health for the animals themselves, but better nutrition for us when we eat them. One of the best studies that I found in doing research for my book was in 2017, Singing Prairie Farm in Missouri compared the nutritional content of meat from three groups of pigs. They took conventionally raised pigs, fed grain. They took pigs on a 
grain ration, and then they took pigs that were fed no grain and allowed to forage. The conventionally raised pork had omega-3 to omega-6 ratio, or excuse me, omega-6 to omega-3 20, of 29 to 1. Where the pork fed no grain, the ratio was reduced to 5 to 1. So that is just like a stunning indicator. You know, 29 to 1 is the ratio in seed oils. It's because when the pigs are fed corn, it just goes straight through into their muscles. And then that is just as inflammatory for us when we eat them. But that ratio of 5 to 1 has all of those anti-inflammatory fats. So you might be thinking pork is bad. Well, maybe high quality pork has a nutrient profile that doesn't predispose our bodies to extra inflammation. So we're going to talk a little bit about more about this later, but it really is a stunning indicator that how the animals are raised and what they eat really does affect the nutrients they provide when they end up on our plate. All right. So the last thing about nutrient density of a food um, that we're going to talk about is processing and storage. So Many nutrients are stripped out in food processing, which is why fortification or adding of nutrients is really common. Choosing to process whole unprocessed or minimally, minimally processed ingredients ensures that you are getting everything, nutritionally speaking, that's available in that food. So this is going to be really important when we're talking about fats and oils. You want to buy them in dark containers and store them in cool places as they can be really easily degraded by light and heat. I've got some tips coming up for you. So a really common question I get is how does cooking affect nutrients? So cooking is both a blessing and a curse when it comes to nutrients. If you've heard people say, you know, eating raw is the only way to go there, you know, there, there are some reasons why raw foods are great, but cooking actually increases digestion, digestion and absorption of many nutrients. Um, for protein, it specifically makes it easier to digest for plant foods, it breaks down a lot of those tough cell walls, making some nutrients more bioavailable. If you're someone who has any type of gut issue, IBS, celiac disease, Crohn's, you know that eating a lot of raw food can be really hard on people that have gentle digestive systems or um, need a little bit of support there. And cooking just makes everything a lot more bioavailable. So no single cooking method is the best way to do it across the board. Um, so I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a breakdown. So the nutrients that are reduced by cooking are water soluble vitamins. So things like vitamin C, especially boiling, and then also B vitamins. Fat soluble vitamins are also reduced and some minerals. Now, if you're cooking a recipe that incorporates all of the juices, except for vitamin C, which um, that vitamin C is going to be inactivated, but a lot of these other things like the minerals and the B vitamins are going to stay in the liquid. So what we don't want to be doing is cooking things in liquid and then throwing out the liquid. If you can figure out how to use the juice, so make like a soup or a stew, um, that can be a really good thing to do. Nutrients that are preserved by cooking are things like phytonutrients, which are often made more bioavailable. Um, sometimes cooking vegetables and fat actually increases the absorption of antioxidants, so pairing things together. Um, and so my next slide is going to have some tips for you guys. So because of this, um, I recommend eating vegetables in a variety of ways. So eat some raw veggies, eat some cooked veggies. Um, one of my favorite tricks is to always have some fresh herbs on hand to sprinkle on top of a hearty super stew, like the chili in this picture. If you guys are familiar with my recipes, you'll notice that I'm a big fan of the garnish. That's not just because it makes the food look really good, but it's also a nutrient density um, thing. Parsley, actually, in particular, on top of that recipe, is one of the highest ounce per ounce sources of vitamin C. And as we learned in the last slide, vitamin C is degraded by cooking. So by adding a little bit to the tops of your meals, you can make sure that you're getting some vitamin C. Um, consume those liquid and pan juices. Use the shortest cooking time. So pressure cooking cookers are great for this because they expose food to heat for the least amount of time. A big misconception is that you're cooking hotter in a pressure cooker. That's not true. It's the same temperature. It's just the added pressure makes the cooking go by faster. And then lastly, chop just before you cook. So this is going to release some of the antioxidants. All right. And then with storing food, 
um, canning and dehydrating preserves some nutrients, but also degrades vitamins B and C due to the heat, something to keep in mind. Um, freezing can preserve vitamin C levels. And so if you have some berries in your yard, maybe pick them all fresh and freeze them right away. Um, keep fruits and vegetables cool. So use your fridge, buy things fresh and store fruits and vegetables whole when possible and then chop them fresh when it's time to cook. And, you know, you guys, this isn't about perfection. <laughs> um, we always get to this point, everyone goes, oh, mind blown. Um, all of these things that we talked about in this section might not apply to you, and that's fine. You might actually have some area that you can work on and, and um, increase the nutrient density and quality pretty easily, and there might be some areas that are not accessible or possible for you due to time. I work with a lot of people with autoimmune disease, and you know, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, for instance, like chopping everything fresh might be really hard for you. Um, so, you know, your mileage may vary. Um, some things to ask about identifying and prioritizing these high quality foods, a little action item for you guys is, do you have the means to grow or raise any of your own food? Um, even potted herbs in the windowsill count. Do you have space for a deep freezer to store bulk food? This is a great way to get your hands on meat and to uh, take advantage of any sales. Um, or do you guys have CSAs near you? Do you have a farmer's market locally where you can shop at? Are there any buying clubs you can join? Are there any nutrient dense foods that you have available specifically where you live? So I'm in the Pacific Northwest, so there's lots of great salmon around here. Um, which nutrient dense foods are most affordable and accessible for you? So, you know, it might be tempting to think that it's required for you to be healthy to eat wild caught salmon in Florida, which is going to be like very difficult to source, but you might actually have a good source of organ meats, or you might be able to find canned sardines at natural grocers, which actually provide the same nutrients. So sometimes it takes being creative there. And um, speaking of prioritization, you guys can use the website ewg.org to determine what fruits and vegetables are safest for uh, purchase conventionally and which ones you should always purchase organic. Again, definitely not about perfection. All right, so let's talk about seasonality. Nature has designed fruits and vegetables to reach peak nutrient density when they're ripe in their traditional growing se season. So it's actually really incredible that in modern times we can have these high se highly seasonal fruits and vegetables like asparagus and blueberries and tomatoes and all these things on grocery store shelves all year round. It's like magic. <laughs> Don't be fooled into thinking that this means they have the same flavor or nutrient content. So some nutrients like vitamin C, you guys are, are understanding probably like vitamin C is a little bit tricky. <laughs> um, it degrades really quickly. And even the vitamin C content in something like broccoli, if you purchase it in the spring versus the fall, some studies have shown that the levels are twice as high in the fall. So same food grown in the same place in the same way, just the only thing different is the season. So produce is often shipped really far sometimes halfway across the world. Um, sometimes they even use chemicals or gases to ripen fruit or vegetables that was picked pr prematurely. Um, so fruits that are harvested before they're actually ripe haven't had as much time to draw out those nutrients from the plant that they came from. So all of this to say, buying produce that's locally in season, ideally from your general area, this is gonna significantly cut down on the chance that your fruits and veggies were subjected to these long distance shipping and maybe don't have the nutrient density that they could. In addition to the rich micronutrient content, fruits and veggies also contain phytonutrients. So these are compounds that they create to protect themselves from their environment. And during their life cycle, these plants are exposed to different stressors. So it might be like a weather, and, and, um, ugh, I'm talking too fast, you guys. <laughs> I get excited about this stuff. 
Um, weather anomalies, so things like a heat wave or maybe like a really early frost, which is something that we're having right now here in Oregon, um, drought, pests, blight. So you might think as a farmer, you're like, I don't want any of those things to happen to my plants. But actually, these stressors stimulate plants to grow really strong and develop the uh, high levels of phytonutrients to actually protect themselves. And in turn, those phytonutrients are really, really good for us when we eat them. So a great example of a phytonutrient is um, curcumin, which is a component of turmeric. You guys have probably heard about it. Um, it's shown to have anti-inflammatory effects. There are like hundreds of studies about it. It's just one well-studied phytonutrient, and there are actually like tens of thousands of them that have not been researched as much. So there's a lot of good stuff in there that we don't really know that much about. <laughs> so your action item is to eat seasonally. The best way to eat in season is to source your food as fresh and local as possible, shopping at farmer's market, um, shopping at stores that provide material from farms that are actually in the area, foraging, growing your own. Um, if you're a planner, you can research what foods in your area and meal plan ahead of time. And you can also preserve your seasonal harvest. So I do this by going to visit a berry farm near where I live in the summer and picking fresh berries and freezing them for the winter instead of buying frozen berries in the winter. Um, I also make pesto in the heat of summer with all of that really delicious and ripe and fresh basil. It's just like heaven. And then I freeze it with a little dollop of olive oil on top um, to enjoy in the winter. And so seasonalfoodguide.org is a great website for checking out which foods are in season um, where you live. You can give them your location, just type it right in there, and they'll give you a customized list for every month. Um, so even here, I'm in Oregon. We're going to have very different foods in season on one side of the mountains versus the other. All right, you guys, so we're on the last topic. We're going to talk about variety. Switching things up brings a different spectrum of nutrients to your diet, whether that includes micronutrients. So we've talked about vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients, different types of fiber. So there are an estimated 30,000 edible species of plant foods worldwide. Humans only cultivate about 150 of those with an even smaller 30 varieties making up the bulk of our diets. So that is just wild, um, the amount of unexplored territory out there, right? Um, I think it's safe to say that we're not even beginning to tap into the diverse resource of plant foods that we have available to us on this planet. So most of the fruits and vegetables that are on our plates today are the product of hundreds of years of selective breeding, cultivation, most recently also genetic modification, and over the years we've prioritized high yields and pest resistance and not really caring that much about flavor and nutrition. Some plants like corn have had so many traits bred out of them that they can't even survive without a farmer. So wild plants have been shown to have a higher nutrient content than those that are cultivated, especially in those vitamin A precursors, vitamin C, omega-3 fatty acids, and the phytonutrients. So while there are some wild plants that can be occasionally found on grocery store shelves like dandelion greens, purslane, watercress, stinging lentil, and chanterelle mushrooms, which... By the way, I find most often at natural grocers, just a little plug there, um, some people obtain them also by foraging. So when we talk about diversity in the diet, we're not just talking about plant foods, we're also talking about protein. Um, although there are only a couple different animal and seafoods most of us tend to eat over and over, there's actually a really good opportunity for diversifying. So in the US, by far, we eat the most um, chicken. We eat chicken twice as much as beef and pork, which are the next two on the list. And sad seafood, categorized as a whole, is eaten much more infrequently, about 20 times less often than chicken. Um, this is a troubling fact for me, as chicken is one of the more nutrient-poor animal protein choices. Remember our comparison up in the beginning of the presentation. Seafood is easily the most nutrient-dense of these. So you can see we kind of have it flopped. <laughs> And then as far as, you know, what you can do about this. So with red meat, beef isn't the only option. Um, we can also try bison, lamb, wild game like elk or venison. Um, with poultry, we can do chicken, turkey, 
duck, pheasant, goose. Um, of course, with seafood, there's the highest opportunity for diversity because there are hundreds of different types of fish and shellfish that you can experiment with, um, and also uh, sea vegetables. So in general, I think everybody can stand to increase their seafood intake. So your action item on this section is to identify some foods outside the spectrum of what you usually eat and start including them in your diet. So it might mean uh, learning to cook something new. Um, I've got some recipes for you. Or um, trying something that maybe you've previously disliked. So you guys, perfectionism isn't a part of this process. There's no badge of honor for the person who learns to love organ meats, oily fish, and kohlrabi. Um, those foods might, might not be for you, but I would just encourage you to look up the nutrients that you're missing out by not eating them and find them somewhere else. Um, okay, so I have a little list of some wild plants. Um, I just want to give a disclaimer. I'm not an expert in wild plants. So, um, you know, before you go pick things in your neighborhood, just make sure that you've done your research, maybe took a, a course and, and have found someone locally who's an expert forager that can help you. But these are some things that you can find at a lot of stores and then some other options that are foraged commonly. And that is the end of my presentation for you science nerds. Um, here are the references to the studies that I used in putting together this presentation. Um, I'll give that a minute for anybody who wants to screenshot it. And then, um, and by the way, my book is The Nutrient Dense Kitchen. I've been told I'm not good enough at trying to promote my, my work. But basically, um, I've tried to put a collection of recipes together for you guys that um, really focuses on this nutrient density piece. And so check that out. Um, and I'm just going to get my myself back on the screen. But I just want to tell you guys that um, cooking for nutrient density really doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be expensive. And what I've done with my work writing recipes is just to really make it accessible and easy for you. So you don't have to be eating a ton of weird stuff that you don't like. There's stuff that you can find at any grocery store um, around the country that you can use to elevate the nutrient density of the meals that you eat every day and live a healthier life. So... There you have it. Thank you so much, Mickey. That was just, that was so great and so much good information. Um, and I want to thank everybody for attending the presentation. And please remember, Mickey's book is Nutrient Dense Kitchen. Um, it's a great book. Um, so try to get out there and get that. Natural Grocers is dedicated to providing nutrition education in our communities. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel and keep an eye for more presentations in the upcoming weeks. Thank you and good night.